Uh, welcome also to those of you watching on C-SPAN and online at Cato.org. <clears throat> at the end of the Cold War, the United States appeared to be standing on the precipice of a new era of peace and prosperity as the world's sole superpower. U.S. leaders adopted a strategy aimed at discouraging others from challenging American power, and they sought to spread democracy and liberal economics within an, economic, within an American sphere of influence that encompassed most of the world. Some called it liberal hegemony. The Harvard political scientist Samuel Huntington called it primacy. Quote, a world without U.S. primacy, he predicted in 1993, will be a world with more violence and disorder and less democracy and economic growth, unquote. Well, we can't know what the world would have looked like without U.S. primacy. But we do know that today, relations with Russia and China are bad and getting worse. There is now open talk of a new Cold War with both nations at the same time, a feat that we mostly managed to avoid in the last Cold War. Meanwhile, Nationalist movements are on the rise, and the European Union and other multilateral bodies seem unsteady at best. And last but not least, the Middle East remains in turmoil, more than 15 years after George W. Bush sent US troops into Iraq. From the ongoing Syrian civil war and the rise of the so-called Islamic State to the suspected murder of a journalist at the hands of Saudi agents and the horrific war in Yemen that has claimed thousands of lives. A recent UN report warned that as many as 13 million people in Yemen are facing starvation in what could be the world's worst famine in over 100 years. In the hell of good intentions, America's foreign policy elite and the decline of US primacy, Stephen Walt traces many of these problems to the flaws inherent in primacy. US power has allowed policymakers to pursue ambitious foreign policy goals, even when those goals are unnecessary or doomed to fail. And yet, despite many setbacks, an entrenched foreign policy elite retains its faith and its influence. Most are hopeful that the sheer weight of inertia will bend Donald Trump to their wishes. And that appears to have been the case so far with respect to the war in Afghanistan, NATO, and the presence of US troops on the Korean Peninsula. For example, all issues that he had previously questioned. Most in the foreign policy elite are prepared to wait him out, confident that the pre-Trump foreign policy can be reconstituted and that the American people will go back to tolerating open-ended military missions and costly foreign entanglements. But there are alternatives to Trumpism and what came before. Walt explores them here, and he outlines the case for an American foreign policy based on realism and restraint, an approach that he also calls, he and others call, offshore balancing. Before he tells you more about the book, let me tell you a bit about Steve. He is the Robert and Renee Belfer Professor of International Affairs at the Harvard Kennedy School. He previously taught at Princeton University and the University of Chicago, where he served as Master of the Social Science Collegiate Division and Deputy Dean of Social Sciences. He has been a resident associate of the Carnegie Endowment for Peace and a guest scholar at the Brookings Institution. And he's also served as a consultant for the Institute for Defense Analysis, the Center for Naval Analysis, and the National Defense University. He presently serves on the editorial boards of Foreign Policy, where he writes regularly the most recent column, This is America's Middle East uh, Strategy on Steroids. That was the piece over the weekend. He writes there regularly, as well as Security Studies, International Relations, and the Journal of Cold War Studies. He also serves as co-editor of the Cornell Studies in Security Affairs series, which includes many fine books, as well as one that I wrote. Thank you. Welcome, Steve. Welcome to Cato, Steve. All right, thanks very much. It is a real pleasure here to be here today to talk about my new book. I want to thank Chris in particular for arranging this whole visit and thank Stephen Wertheim for being willing to come and uh, explain what I got wrong. Uh, what I want to do is focus on two big questions. Uh, and the first one is, how did we get here? Uh, there was, as Chris said, tremendous optimism when the Cold War ended, but that's not the world we're living in today. So the question is, what went wrong? And I'm going to argue that the United States deserves a lot of the blame. Not all of it, but a lot of it. 
Um, and then the second question is, how could we do better? And here I will lay out the case for a different grand strategy, sketch what needs to happen uh, in order to bring that about, and along the way I'll explain why I don't think Donald Trump is the guy who is going to deliver it uh, to us. So let me start with the bad news and flesh out a few of the things that uh, Chris said. Remember that unipolar moment? The United States was dominant. The wind was at our back. Our problems were really confined to a few pesky dictators who hadn't gotten the memo. Think back to the early 1990s. The United States is on good terms with all the major powers in the world, including Russia and China. Democracy is spreading worldwide. Iraq has been disarmed. Iran has no nuclear enrichment capacity. We thought we had capped North Korea's nuclear program as well. Globalization is spreading rapidly under American auspices with the formation of the WTO. NATO and the EU are beginning to expand. The Oslo Accords give us all hope for a lasting peace in the Middle East. The American military seems unstoppable, and the US economy is doing pretty well, too. Now the world of 2018. China's power and ambitions have grown dramatically. Russia has seized Crimea, interfered in several other countries, relations with Moscow worse than at any time since the Cold War. And as Chris said, Moscow and Beijing increasingly aligned. Democracy is in retreat. According to Freedom House, 2017 marked the 12th consecutive year of a decline in global freedom. And last year, the Economist Intelligence Unit's annual democracy index downgraded the United States of America from a full to a flawed democracy. Since 1993, North Korea, India, and Pakistan have all tested nuclear weapons, and Iran is now essentially a latent nuclear power with the capacity to get a nuclear weapon if it ever wants to. Repeated efforts to broker an Israeli-Palestinian peace were all humiliating diplomatic failures, and the two-state solution that was advocated by Clinton, Bush, and Obama now farther away than ever. Of course, the United States was also attacked on September 11th, and we responded by invading first Afghanistan, then Iraq. Both wars turned into costly disasters that weakened our overall strategic position, and the American military, though still impressive, no longer seems unstoppable. And finally, today much of the Middle East is in flames, and American interference helped create failed states in Libya and Yemen and Syria. So back in 2016, when Donald Trump called US foreign policy a complete and total disaster and accused the foreign policy establishment of being out of touch and unaccountable, many Americans nodded their heads in agreement. The taproot of all of those failures, I argue in this book, was the US commitment to a grand strategy of liberal hegemony. This strategy sees the United States as the indispensable nation that is uniquely qualified to spread democracy, markets, and other liberal institutions, and to bring other states into a web of alliances and institutions led by Washington. When you think about it, it's a highly revisionist grand strategy. Instead of defending our own territory, upholding the balance of power in a few key regions, Liberal hegemony seeks to change the status quo in many parts of the world, peacefully if possible, but if necessary, by force, and remake the world in America's image. The problem is, however much we may like those liberal values, and I certainly do, liberal hegemony is fundamentally flawed as a strategy. For starters, it inflates our defense requirements. By 2016, the United States was formally committed to defending more countries around the world than at any time in our nation's history, including some that were weak, vulnerable, hard to protect. It also allows our allies to free ride, or in some cases, act recklessly, because they know Uncle Sam will bail them out if they get into trouble. Second, by definition, trying to spread liberal values inevitably threatens non-democratic regimes who found lots of ways to thwart our aims. It also assumes that we know how to create democracies in the wake of regime change, but toppling foreign governments led to failed states and costly occupations instead. And when you think about it, looking back, the belief that we could do this kind of radical social engineering in places like Iraq, 
Libya, Afghanistan, Somalia, or Yemen was positively delusional. You know, what were we thinking? Globalization did produce real gains for many, especially in Asia and the 1% here at home, but not for the lower and middle classes throughout the West. Bottom line, liberal hegemony has been a failure. So why did we do this? Why did we embark on this foolish crusade and persist in the face of repeated disappointments? Well, one reason is primacy itself, the extraordinary power, wealth, security that the United States enjoyed. But when you think about it, that's still a puzzle. Why did we do this given that we were already in remarkably good shape and this ambitious effort wasn't really necessary? Well, another reason is our own values. We see them as of universal validity that really ought to be brought to the rest of the world, makes it hard to resist the temptation and to believe others will welcome it if we bring them to them. But the most immediate reason, I argue, was the powerful consensus within Washington and within the foreign policy elite, a consensus not shared by the general public. By the elite, I mean Americans who are actively engaged on a more or less constant basis with issues of international affairs. In other words, I'm talking about the blob. So it's formal institutions of government, the president, NSC, departments of state, defense, intelligence agencies, etc. It's membership organizations like the Council on Foreign Relations. It's think tanks like Brookings, AEI, Carnegie, and many, many others. It's special interest groups and lobbies who weigh in on any number of issues from arms control to human rights to regional politics to whatever, dozens of them too. Those parts of the media that deal with foreign affairs and of course academics like me who work on foreign affairs and occasionally get involved in public debate or and sometimes serve in key government positions and train students who will join the blob eventually too. Let me just say a couple of things about this elite when you think about it. First, there are no formal membership requirements. There's no required degree, no bar exam, no medical board certification. You need a real estate license to sell real estate but not to practice foreign policy. All it takes is convincing some people in the elite that you're smart, energetic, have thing, important things to say, useful and loyal. That's all the only real membership requirement. Second, it's a community, especially as you rise up within it, where everybody knows everybody else, right? Leading members know each other well, participate in lots of overlapping organizations, will work at lots of different jobs in the course of a career. Because it's a community with no membership requirements, your success depends on your networks and on maintaining a positive reputation. And that means staying within the acceptable consensus. So despite all of the partisan warfare you see in Washington, there is in fact remarkable agreement within the foreign policy elite about what America's role in the world should be. What's that consensus? You know it as well as I do. NATO is essential. Israel is beyond criticism. Iran, Russia, and China are bad. Nuclear proliferation is bad, but America's nuclear arsenal is essential. Free trade is mostly good. Terrorism is the absolute worst. Democracy and human rights are important, except when close allies fall short. And most important of all, the United States must exercise leadership on every issue and in every part of the globe, has the right to overthrow or pressure or sanction any governments we happen to dislike if we think we can get away with it. Questioning any of those ideas is not a smart career move in Washington. And to show just how pervasive this is, uh, in the book I talk about three task forces that have occurred over the last 15 years. The Princeton Project on National Security in 2006, the Project for a United and Strong America in 2013, and the CNAS report Extending American Power in 2016. Each of these is bipartisan, each is produced by bold-faced names in the foreign policy elite. The circumstances in which they're written are very different one of them before Iraq goes south and before the financial crisis, the other two afterwards, and yet they are virtually interchangeable. The recommendations, the policy prescriptions, are, and the justifications for them uh, are essentially identical. Now, there are obviously some disagreements within the blob over specific foreign policy issues, the Iran deal, intervention in Syria, things like that. But overall, voices supporting liberal hegemony far outweigh the number of voices saying that the United States might be overcommitted 
and should act, therefore, with greater restraint. There are a few places, like the building that we're in today, but not very many. So why does the foreign policy elite like liberal hegemony so much? Well, partly because many of these people genuinely believe in these ideals, think they're good for America and would be good for the world. But of course, trying to remake the world in America's image also increases their power and status, their claim to budget shares, their sense of self-worth and achievement, and it gives them plenty to do. So in other words, liberal hegemony is something of a full employment policy for the foreign policy elite. The American people, however, have a somewhat different view. On the one hand, they reject isolationism overwhelmingly. Surveys show this repeatedly. But they also want a much more restrained foreign policy. In 2013, for example, 80% of Americans surveyed agreed with the statement, quote, we should not think so much in international terms, but concentrate on our own national problems and building up strength here at home, 80%. Consider also that the last four U.S. presidents ran for office promising to do less in foreign policy. Bill Clinton, it's the economy, stupid. George W. Bush, a humble foreign policy and no nation building. Barack Obama, ending foolish wars, rebuilding ties with the rest of the world, and don't do stupid stuff. Donald Trump, our foreign policy is a complete and total disaster. We're getting out of the nation building business. But that's, of course, not what they do once they're president. So given this gap between the elite and the public, how does the foreign policy elite get the public to go along? There's sort of four basic techniques. I have a chapter describing them. One is threat inflation, exaggerate foreign dangers to justify going all over the world. Two, exaggerate the benefits of liberal hegemony. It will spread values. It will increase stability in the world. Of course, it hasn't been doing either one for the last quarter century. Step three, conceal the costs, pay for wars by borrowing the money rather than uh, through taxes, use air power, use drones, use the all volunteer force so the American people don't actually uh, have to watch what's really going on. And then step four, don't hold anyone accountable. Consider that the people responsible for the Iraq war remain respected figures and some of them, like John Bolton, are in top jobs today. You can lobby to invade Iraq, screw up the occupation, then become president of the World Bank, as Paul Wolfowitz did, resign under a cloud, land in a safe sinecure at AEI, and then get appointed to the State Department's International Security Advisory Board. Right? It's hard to screw up in this line of work. You can be convicted of lying to Congress, get pardoned, go back into government, screw up again, land a nice sinecure at the council, and nearly become Deputy Secretary of State, as Elliot Abrams has done. By contrast, those who challenge the consensus view usually get marginalized, even when subsequent events show that they were right all along. And I've got a number of examples in the book of this happening. So in short, the foreign policy world in Washington is something of a self-protective community. And the real question we want to ask ourselves, is this a healthy situation? If the people who got it wrong pay little price for it professionally, um, and the people who got things right don't get recognized, why should we ever expect to do better? So now the question is, well, what about Trump? Isn't he going to solve this, drain the swamp, challenge the blob, make America great again? Uh, alas, no, and that chapter is called How Not to Fix Foreign Policy. Uh, to be sure, President Trump has done many things quite differently, and his personal style as president is unprecedented, including the way he approaches foreign policy. But as with the transition from Bush to Obama, a lot is still the same. Uh, we have a series of trade wars that end up producing new trade agreements uh, where you have to squint really hard to see how they differ from the old trade agreement. Our commitment to NATO remains intact. His complaints about burden sharing are nothing new. They go back to Eisenhower. We have the same set of commitments in the Middle East. If anything, we're just doubling down on the same set of allies. And yes, he did get out of the Iran deal, but remember, the Iran deal was a very narrow win for the Obama administration. That was almost evenly balanced, right? So he's not reversing course. He's just going with a different faction uh, within the blob. Uh, we continue to criticize our adversaries for human rights abuses, but not our friends or allies. Look at how we are now sweeping things under the rug with Saudi Arabia. 
Just like President Obama, President Trump has sent more troops to Afghanistan, and he used exactly the same rationale, making sure that Afghanistan does not become a safe haven for terrorists. China is still seen as our primary rival. Russia is still facing sanctions over Ukraine and its other activities. And we're still spending more on defense than the next eight or 10 countries combined. In short, his style is different, no question about that. But substance has not changed nearly as much. So let me wrap this up as I do in the book by outlining a, a different way of doing business, a better way. Instead of liberal hegemony, we should adopt a strategy that some of us have called offshore balancing. This recognizes the United States is in fact still remarkably secure, more secure than any other country. The main threat to our long-term security would be the emergence of a rival uh, that dominated its region of the world the same way we dominate the Western Hemisphere, where we are essentially free of any serious dangers or threats. And therefore, if such a country existed and dominated its own neighborhood, it would be free to project power around the world the same way the United States has been doing for a long time, including, if it wished, into the Western Hemisphere. So the United States should seek to prevent that from happening, and that's been our policy at other parts of our history. We should, however, try to get other countries who are also threatened by this to bear as much of the burden as possible, pass the buck to them when we can do it, not when we can't. What does that mean in practical terms? Well, China is really the only potential regional hegemon, peer competitor out there. So we should focus on balancing China in Asia. We should gradually reduce our military role in Europe so that Europe becomes responsible for its own defense. I can say more about why I think that's easy uh, for them to do. We should reduce our presence in the Middle East and have normal relations with all countries there, including Iran, instead of special relations with some countries and no relations with others. Um, we should get out of the regime change and nation building business and stay out. Uh, we are not going to get better at this if we keep practicing. We should place much more emphasis on diplomacy. Think of military power, sanctions, and coercion as our last resort rather than our first impulse. And finally, we should definitely promote traditional American values largely by setting a good example here at home, making the United States a country that others look at and want to emulate and want to have institutions like ours because they're working so well here not by trying to force feed other countries a set of institutions they may not want. This is not, I hasten to add, isolationism. The United States would still be engaged economically, diplomatically, and in some parts of the world militarily, and this is not Fortress America. The United States would still have to have fairly robust defense capabilities, if not quite the set of things we have now. The foreign policy elite is likely to resist this approach, and it won't be adopted unless we create a foreign policy elite or establishment with a view of America's global role that's closer to what most Americans say they want. So I close the book with some practical advice on how to bring that about, how a more restrained grand strategy actually could be made uh, marketable and sold to the American public, who I think would welcome it uh, very readily. To conclude, um, Adam Smith uh, famously wrote that there is a lot of ruin in a nation, and that's why the wealthy and powerful United States has survived its rather haphazard and idealistic approach to foreign policy. Or as uh, Bismarck supposedly said, there seems to be a special providence that looks after drunkards, fools, and the United States of America, to which I say that's a good thing. The real danger we are facing today is not a powerful array of foreign adversaries who are going to snatch our security, prosperity, and way of life away from us while we're not looking. The problems we're facing abroad are mostly of our own making. You know, as Walt Kelly said many years ago, we have met the enemy and he is us. So we are at something of a crossroads here. Down one road lies more of the same with the same unhappy results. Down another road lies a much more realistic strategy that has served the country rather well in the past. It's not, in my view, the foreign policy Donald Trump is going to deliver, but I do think it's the foreign policy that most Americans actually want. And so the question with which I end the book is simply, how long will it take before they get it? 
Thank you very much. I'll look forward to Steve's comments and then your reactions. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, we'll now hear from Stephen Wertheim. Uh, Stephen is a visiting scholar at the Saltzman Institute of War and Peace Studies at Columbia University. He's also a visiting assistant professor in history there. He researches US foreign relations and international order from the 19th century to the present, a special focus on concepts of politics and law. He's currently writing a book about the birth of US global supremacy in World War II, so particularly appropriate that he'd be here. His previous academic postings include a permanent lecture in history at Birkbeck, University of London, junior research fellow at King's College, Cambridge, and a postdoctoral research associate at Princeton. He's also published commentary in Foreign Affairs, The Nation, The New York Times, The Washington Post, and elsewhere. And I believe that he has a forthcoming essay in the works on this very book, so you all might be getting a sneak preview on that. Stephen. <laughs> All right, well, many thanks for uh, inviting me here, and thank you all the more now that I have had the opportunity uh, to read Professor Walt's new book. The Hell of Good Intentions demands wide reading and serious consideration. It delivers, as you've heard, a bracing challenge to American foreign policy in the past quarter century, and if that weren't enough, to the people and institutions that have shaped that foreign policy. The book focuses our attention on the 1990s as the pivotal decade, when it argues that American foreign policy went awry. This is further back than the war on terror, which many citizens might single out. On the other hand, it isn't nearly as far back as 1945, which a string of experts have invoked in order to interpret the stakes of this moment as they've rallied to defend what they've called the post-war liberal international order. Professor Walt has a different view, and I think he's right. We need to reckon with the 1990s. American foreign policy experts are disoriented today because events at home and globally are thwarting the expectations that they formed from their own lived experience. In the 90s, foreign policy experts came to believe and expect that the world was fast moving toward liberal democracy, toward peace, toward ever closer economic integration, all under a benevolent US leadership that was supposed to be at once indispensable and low in cost. Alternatives, I think, to this liberal vision were so thoroughly trounced in the 1990s that their return in our time has come as a genuine shock. That shock is on us to some extent. The book is particularly powerful in explaining not just why American foreign policy uh, has uh, gotten the policy wrong, but also why the foreign policy community has failed to do what an expert community should do, debate alternatives, reassess assumptions, provide accountability for its members. Unusually, for a book about foreign policy, Professor Walt delivers a sustained analysis of the conditions under which knowledge and policy are produced. And more than other expert communities, he argues, the foreign policy community runs on loyalty, is removed from the public, and displays a bias toward greater American activism in world affairs, since the more American foreign policy attempts to do, the more experts might be hired to do it. These were sobering chapters uh, to read, in part, I think, because it might be easier to devise a blueprint for a better foreign policy than it is to change the incentives of the institutions that shape the debate. Now that leads me to an immediate question about the relationship between the two levels of analysis of the book, the story of foreign policy and the story of the foreign policy community. One can readily see how a new foreign policy emerged in the 1990s. It was announced in presidential speeches and national security strategies, manifested in policies like NATO enlargement, the dual containment of Iraq and Iran, and ultimately defense budget increases. But I wonder whether Professor Walt sees the 1990s as equally pivotal for the institutional culture of the foreign policy community. Had that expert community been hollowed out in perhaps in the later decades of the Cold War, rendering it unable to grapple with changed international circumstances thereafter? 
Or did the triumphalism that followed the Soviet collapse change our institutional culture for the worse, suppressing the, er the airing of alternatives to liberal hegemony? I'm myself open to both possibilities, and they could both be true. But I do think that the range of alternatives aired in public uh, narrowed over the course of the 1990s. At the level of party politics, the first Gulf War divided Democrats and the Senate authorized it by a narrow vote of 52 to 47. Some foreign policy intellectuals did advocate significant retrenchment after the fall of the wall, no less than neoconservative Jean Kirkpatrick urged the United States to become, quote, a normal country in a normal time, now that it no longer faced an aggressive rival. But by the late 1990s, it seems to me, those voices diminished. A new generation of neoconservatives gathered in the project for a new American century, and they were mirrored by liberal interventionists who began to advocate the routine use of force uh, for humanitarian purposes. So it seems that US foreign policy grew significantly more militaristic over the course of the 1990s. By contrast, the hell of good intentions argues that the grand strategy of liberal hegemony was in place from the start of the decade. Alternatives never got a hearing. And that may well be true on the level of grand strategy. But I nevertheless wonder why dissenting voices seemed to dissipate over the course of the decade. Then, if Professor Walt is correct that liberal hegemony took hold from the outset of the 1990s with the Bush and Clinton administrations scarcely bothering to consider an alternative, how do we explain that? If liberal hegemony appeared in the guise of common sense, policymakers must have inherited something like it from the Cold War or earlier. And yet the book mostly praises American foreign policy prior to the 1990s. During the Cold War, it states American leaders got many big things right, though they exaggerated the threat of communism. The threat was real nonetheless. Now, I don't uh, doubt that the Soviet Union was a far more formidable adversary than the various threats that uh, have been inflated in the post-Cold War world. But was not the Cold War about more than opposing a Soviet or communist enemy? The Cold War also, I would argue, began in part as a vehicle for the United States to pursue a project of world ordering under US political military leadership, in short, primacy, this being a role that was first conceived in World War II. If so, it isn't just a dysfunctional foreign policy community that gave us liberal hegemony in the 1990s to the present. But it was also the inheritance of primacy over many decades in which American foreign policy was widely perceived as a success. So perhaps that perception of success needs to be questioned or the successes more precisely separated from the excesses. Uh, and this task may be especially important uh, to do as the US confronts a rising China about which the book, uh, though it doesn't go into great de de detail, makes somewhat uh, hawkish noises in my, in my reading, at least about balancing a, a rising China. Finally, let me just turn from the problem to the solution. How might the future be different? The book ends on a surprisingly upbeat note. Because it puts the biases of the blob at the center of its diagnosis, it also makes a prescription build a countervailing set of institutions that can enter the marketplace of ideas in the service of a restrained foreign policy. Now, that sounds good to me. But a question. Given that some such institutions exist and existed in the 1990s, will change happen by swelling their ranks, or should advocates of restraint do something qualitatively different? In the 1990s, realists had articulate exponents in prominent universities and think tanks, so what went wrong and was the answer wholly external to realism? It does seem to me that realism, whatever the power of its analysis, has its lim limits as a language to be deployed in popular politics. And a long line of realist past, including George Kennan, have grown frustrated that their form of realism proved antithetical to American political culture with its moralism and its exceptionalism. Ultimately, the ideas produced by counter institutions will have to work through party politics. And in a recent column 
Professor Walt has suggested how this might happen, perhaps through a left-right coalition of libertarians and progressives. But it struck me that the book makes some rhetorical appeals that are actually more traditional than where this emergent possible coalition might be heading. For example, the book pays homage to American exceptionalism in a non-interventionist variety, stating that America should set a model for others to emulate. This is even though the Sanders and Trump candidacies went considerably further and tended to cast the United States as a backward or declining country that needed to emulate others. The book also pays some homage to primacy, stating that an offshore balancing strategy will help to maintain US military superiority, even though polls of millennials show a declining desire for primacy itself. Now, I know it's probably not every day that you're accused of not being provocative enough, so hopefully that's a refreshing sensation. One last thought on the subject of the power of party politics. Professor Walt's target in the book is what he identifies as the grand strategy of liberal hegemony. And I accept that that's a useful category of analysis, particularly in characterizing policy experts. But I wonder if it's less useful in describing politicians and citizens, the wider world of political contestation. When it comes to this wide political arena, does Professor Walt engage in a bit of unwitting threat inflation by crediting his adversary with possessing something so thoughtful and elaborate as a grand strategy of liberal hegemony. <laughs> Perhaps primacy is less a strategy than an assumption. In good times, that assumption might go unquestioned. But in bad times, that assumption is thrown open. Primacy might, in such times, be aggressively reasserted as the current administration is attempting. Yet primacy might also prove easier to dislodge than we might think. So I will leave it there, and you can see how stimulating I found the book. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you to you both. I, uh, I'm going to exercise my moderator's privilege here and um, try to tease out two things. I was going to comment on something related to what uh, Stephen said near the end about building alternatives and... Um, that might be a little self-serving uh, because it is true that one of the few places in this town that is uh, called out as an exception is the Cato Institute. We're quite proud of that, to be honest. Um, so my first question for Steve is, is it as simple as that? And it's not simple, but is it as simple as creating more institutions like Cato? It's not impossible. There are exceptions. So, so what's striking about this book is that there are so many cases in which the, the, the impulse to go along uh, is, is nearly overpowering, and yet there are exceptions. Should we try to replicate that? Should we try to identify what it is that makes certain people sort of stand out from the crowd? Um, and, and can it be replicated? That's a, that's a question. The second question is somewhat related, and I'm going to take it in, in a different direction based on, on Stephen's remarks. And that is, um, there's a passage in the book where you quote from uh, Dwight Eisenhower's Chance for Peace speech. This is the speech in which the, the president, uh, this is one of his first speeches as president in 1953, where he talks about opportunity costs. Right? He talks about trade-offs. He talks about every, uh, every bomber built, every warship launched is a, is a theft from those who hunger and, and are not fed and those who are uh, naked and not clothed. Uh, it's a terrific speech. Many of you probably know the military-industrial complex speech, his, his last speech as president, but you should know as well his first speech as president, first major speech as president. I thought it interesting, Steve, that you called attention to that speech um, because you will recall, um, Dwight Eisenhower was absolutely savaged during his presidency for suggesting that there was such a thing as opportunity cost, for suggesting that we actually had to be concerned with such trade-offs, because it was closed-minded. And this sort of obsession with fis fiscal balance and things like that was, was his worst sin as far as 
uh, most, uh, at the time, hawkish liberals, hawkish Democrats, large D Democrats. Um, eventually, of course, they, we came to call them Scoop Jackson Democrats, and then be, we call them, now we call them neoconservatives, because that's where they ended up. But, th but I, was, I reread that, that section today in preparation for this session, and it sort of reminded me, where is the natural constituency for restraint and offshore balancing? Is it among the anti-war pacifist left, of which we here at the Cato Institute also trace a long tradition to? Or is it uh, appealing to people who are concerned about the trade-offs between building a better country uh, here at home at the, and, and not at the expense of trying to overreach abroad? So two hopefully related questions. <clears throat> Yeah, please, please, yeah. Uh, I'll try to, you know, to weave a response both to what Stephen had to say and what uh, Chris just said. Um, I mean, first of all, uh, the focus on the 1990s, as I think, is, is basically right. Um, in some respects, I make the argument that Clinton got lucky. Because Clinton launched a lot of these uh, initiatives with great hope and optimism, and optimism is really not surprising if you go back and remember sort of how people were really thinking at the time. Um, and the negative consequences all came home to roost after he was president, right, in September 11th and in the backlash against NATO expansion and other things like that, but he was gone by then. Um, so in that sense, he got quite lucky. Um, there wasn't a lot of debate. There were a few people in the academic world, and Gene Kirkpatrick said some things, and a couple of other people also suggested it got almost no traction at all. They were little uh, ivory tower discussions. They, uh, I think, never really resonated here. There was one actually revealing moment early in the Clinton administration, Peter Tarnoff, uh, who was Under Secretary of State, I believe, at the time, said at one point in response to a question about the Balkans that, well, you know, the United States is not always going to take the lead on things. Um, sometimes we're just going to let others deal with it. And he is rebuked immediately by the White House. And, you know, that's not our policy. That's not the American position. There's the one case where an official, you know, I think inadvertently sort of strayed outside the lines and the, the leash is yanked uh, again, uh, essentially uh, overnight. Um, I think part of, you mentioned the institutional culture here. What is also striking is the sort of um, exclusion of realism from the 1990s onward. Um, so the Brent Scowcroft wing of the Republican Party, which I also would associate with sort of Colin Powell and maybe even sort of uh, the original Dick Cheney as opposed to the subsequent Dick Cheney, um, that view is really powerfully held within the Republican Party, but they basically retire and are not replaced. They're re replaced by neoconservatives uh, instead. It becomes much harder to argue for a realist foreign policy in a unipolar era. Because after all, realism is all about the constraints constraints all states face in a competitive world. But when you're the 800 pound gorilla, you just don't see any constraints. And when people point out, you know, this Iraq war is not gonna work out very well, as many realists did in 2002, it's really hard to convince people that that's the case. Look, we knocked off the Taliban in six weeks. We can do almost anything. This is gonna be great. It's gonna pay for itself and transform the Middle East. And you could raise your hand and point out this wasn't such a smart idea and we we're gonna get bogged down there. We're gonna be there forever. But it's not surprising people didn't pay much attention. Uh, third feature here, there's, I think, uh, a lot of what explains this is, is sort of the log rolling of interests. So you think about, again, the broad foreign policy community. Some people want the United States to use its power to promote human rights in a variety of parts of the world. Some people want us to use our power to prevent the spread of weapons of mass destruction. By the way, these are all worthy objectives. Uh, some people want uh, us to continue to defend NATO because NATO is the most sacred alliance in our history, most successful, et cetera, et cetera. Some people want us to support Taiwan against China. Some people want us to back different countries in the Middle East. If everybody gets a little bit of what they want, if there's a sort of big law row, the United States ends up very busy, ends up responsible for essentially every corner of the planet. And that's a lot of what uh, is going on here too. And I think it is hard for us to resist that, particularly in periods where we think we're on top of the world, because it is wired into our our political DNA, the set of values that we regard as uh, valid for all, uh, all human beings. Um, one, uh, so the question then is, is, what about reform? Is it as simple as just creating a bunch of institutions? I think creating a more diverse intellectual 
uh, an institutional population here in Washington would go a long way, but that's not a simple enterprise in its own right. You know, creating one or two think tanks helps, but it, you need more than that because, as I suggest, the balance of power right now is overwhelmingly on the other side of this, uh, this conversation. Um, you're invoking of Eisenhower. I mean, I, I like that Eisenhower speech and the military industrial complex speech. And you occasionally see signs of it uh, penetrating. So Richard Haas, the president of the Council on Foreign Relations, wrote a book a few years ago called Foreign Policy Begins at Home. It's in the wake of the financial crisis and sort of saying, we got to get our house in order here. We got problems, political dysfunction, uh, deficits, you name it. Why do we need to do that? The reason is not in his telling, so Americans in the United States can lead healthier, more plentiful, more fulfilling, more secure lives. No, the reason we need to get our house in order is so that we can continue to exercise influence around the world. And Richard, whom I like, is something of a realist. Right? He's more on the realist side than a lot of other people. And here he's basically saying, you gotta fix things at home, not to set a good example, but in order to, to wield influence. Um, the one little bit of optimism, and I'll pick up on both things, you might say is I am occasionally struck by how what appear to be uh, you know, icebergs that will never melt <laughs> suddenly disappear. So when I was 15 years old, I would not have thought it possible that you wouldn't be able to smoke in America, uh, except in <laughs> private circumstances. You wouldn't be able to smoke on an airplane. Right? And yet, in a relatively uh, short amount of time, that whole set of norms changed dramatically. Uh, I wouldn't have thought in 1990 that gay people could get married in the United States. And that's another place where attitudes shifted with surprising speed. So I think it is possible if you had a broader conversation, if you had more voices engaged, pointing out what has gone wrong in the past and suggesting that there were real alternatives uh, that might go better, um, that you would find the political community, which often resembles a weather vane, suddenly beginning to respond. Right? And one other final thing that could contribute to that, of course, is the arrival of a new generation of Americans, millennials, coming of political age, getting more actively involved, who do not have the same set of political attitudes, at least according to surveys. Now, they may get persuaded, they may get converted, uh, international events may uh, alter their thinking, but there may be more fluidity here in the body politic than I am suggesting in the book. Uh, I don't think it's going to flip the switch is going to flip overnight, but things could change more rapidly. And I guess, you know, why I wrote the book, I think we're going to end up with a much more sensible policy at some point in my lifetime, but I'd like it to be sooner rather than later. <laughs> and I'm trying to accelerate that process a little bit. Very thank good. you. All right. Thank you, Steve. All right. So we do have time for questions. Um, please wait for the microphone for the benefit of those uh, watching on C-SPAN and online. Uh, please identify yourself and your affiliation if you have one. Um, and I'll remind everyone that here at the Cato Institute, the Jeopardy rule applies, which means uh, you have to phrase your question in the form of a question. Uh, please do that. Um, uh, in the blue shirt there, in the glasses, uh, right there. Thank you, Dr. Wald. Uh, my name is Evan Sankey. I'm at Johns Hopkins SICE. I'd like to touch on something you mentioned in passing. You, in, at the very beginning, you mentioned that uh, the counter-proliferation -pro goal of liberal hegemony, it, it, that you included that amongst its goals. I, I regard that as one of the strongest cases for liberal hegemony. And I'm wondering, in the in uh, under offshore balancing, how do you how do you defend offshore balancing against the the charge that it's it's going to lead to a lot of proliferation? Thank you. Yeah. That's a great question. So the, I'd sort of defend it in two ways. Uh, it is possible that if the United States went to a, a more restrained foreign policy, sort of offshore balancing uh, approach, that some countries might decide in order to be secure uh, they needed to acquire nuclear weapons. Uh, I concede that possibility. Now, notice it wouldn't be uh, in my uh, depiction, uh, countries like South Korea or Japan, because we were going to remain pretty closely engaged with them. Maybe some others would. But a couple of other points. First of all, the fears of proliferation chains in the past have been, I think, overblown. 
right? The idea that if one country gets nuclear weapons, then a whole series of its neighbors are going to, right? So North Korea is now a nuclear weapons state, but you don't see other countries stampeding to get nuclear weapons themselves. Second point is liberal hegemony has actually done a pretty crappy job of preventing uh, proliferation. When you think about it, right, Iran is now a near nuclear weapon state. It wasn't in 1993. It wasn't, it didn't have any centrifuges operating in the year 2000. But I will just point out to people that continually threatening a country with regime change, as we have done with Iran for 25 years, is probably not the best way to convince them that they don't need a nuclear deterrent, right? And so Iran is a failure. Ira India and Pakistan, again, a failure of American counterproliferation policy under uh, liberal hegemony as well. So it's not like liberal hegemony is going to prevent this problem. Some countries, for their own reasons, are going to decide they need nuclear weapons. Um, we can, in some cases, forestall that, in other cases not. Final point is, and this is, again, slightly heretical, it's not obvious that a few more countries acquiring nuclear weapons would be uh, the tragedy or the catastrophe that we often declare. I mean, every time a country gets close to the nuclear threshold, we immediately assume that all hell will break loose if it crosses the line, and it does and all hell does not break loose. We thought that when China went nuclear, we worried about some other countries as well. I'm not saying that we should encourage proliferation. I actually think we ought to be restricting it as well. But it's hard for me to see what we've been doing as a particularly successful policy either. I, don't, I think preventing proliferation is hard under sort of any grand strategy. Uh, over there along the wall? Yes, right there. Thank you. Great talk. Uh, Doug Brooks, uh, International Stability Operations Association, also, also uh, University of Fiji. Uh, the one thing that has really, I think, dominated, to me, policy that's really dominated uh, uh, recent years has been the, the free trade uh, and the reality that a billion Asians have, have come from abject poverty to uh, some form of prosperity. Uh, and yet trade is the first target of uh, uh, of the current president and other presidents too, and and the GOP, which used to defend trade, has sort of bought into to the Trump perspective, and the Democrats are uh, have never really uh, been anxious to support uh, uh, cheap Asian labor. Uh, why is trade the target? Is there any? You say you're an optimist at the end of your book. I'm kind of curious because this, if this is a target, nobody's defending free trade. Uh, what's in the future for that? Um, <clears throat> so free trade uh, is, I think, the one part of liberal hegemony where there's not as firm a consensus uh, within the body politic. Um, I, there has been a, something of a bipartisan consensus for it, but it's always been a pretty fragile one. Um, and so it's not surprising to me that this is the one place where I think you know, Trump has gone furthest uh, in turning in a very different direction. Remember that NAFTA back in 93, 94, was a tough sell for the Clinton administration. They really had to work hard to get that through. And they got it through, by the way, with lots of Republican uh, support in opposition to the sort of labor uh, wing of the Democratic Party. And, and as you say, that some of that has shifted now for a variety uh, of different reasons. It's not, I think it was a huge mistake for Trump to walk away from TPP on his third day in office. Um, for sort of more geostrategic reasons, but it is not obvious to me that they could have gotten that through the Senate. Maybe. It's not obvious to me that Hillary Clinton, who, remember, opposed TPP in the campaign, said she didn't support it, would have gotten it through either, suggesting that the consensus here is a little bit more fragile. And I think the reason is pretty straightforward. Um, it turns out, in terms of political salience, if you think you lost your job because of foreign competition, that really hurts. If you think that you're getting somewhat cheaper goods as a result of international trade, which you are, by the way, that's much less salient. It's nice for something to cost, you know, a buck fifty as opposed to two bucks, but you don't really notice it. The people who are affected negatively are really affected. The people who benefit are all of us, and it's more, much more diffuse. So in political terms, you know, someone who lost their job because of foreign trade uh, is going to be more politically agitated by that. And of course, there are 
interest groups and lobbies who are quickly uh, going to amplify that uh, message at all. And then just one final point. It's clear that globalization has had some effects on American competitiveness in some areas, not all by any means, in some. But the loss of, say, manufacturing jobs has been due much more to automation than to foreign competition as well. And that suggests, you know, maybe if we hadn't been doing quite as much uh, other activity in other places, we would have found the money to uh, be more competitive in some of those industries as well. Okay, uh, right there. <clears throat> And then I see a hand in the back, so we'll get to you next. Right, right there. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Wald. Uh, I'm Austin Doler. I'm with the Center for European Policy Analysis. Now, you mentioned at one point that something like 80% of the American public would be for a shift in U.S. foreign policy that you think would fit more so the vision you put forward in the book. But I'm wondering if the American public probably is it the average American probably isn't that informed on the nuances of US foreign policy. So I wonder if maybe broadly they might be for a new foreign policy, but when you get down to specific issues like you mentioned how countering China would probably involve some sort of TPP free trade agreement, which like we just said, free trade is largely unpopular in the American public right now, or the normalization of Iran, I can't imagine being very popular broadly. Can't imagine that being a winning issue for someone running for president. So I wonder when you get down to specific new foreign policy, like dynamic changes, will like how do you plan on uh, politicians selling though to the public when they're running for office? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so there's a, a I don't know five or six pages in the book, sort of laying out a whole series of survey results on what the American people feel. And it, you're absolutely right. I mean, first of all, most Americans don't care that much about foreign policy. It's way down on the list, which is one of the reasons that our foreign policy establishment can do all the things they've doing. Most Americans don't care unless something really bad happens. And then the attention uh, pops up. Nonetheless, there is this quite persistent gap going back actually pre-1990 of the American people being less interested in a really energetic attempt to shape the rest of the world. Um, they will take, they will follow elite cues. So if the elite is really unified and says something it has to happen, then they'll sort of go along, provided the costs are relatively small. Um, but they also tend to notice when things go badly, <laughs> right? And so you know, you you look at George Bush's approval ratings from 2001 to 2008 before the financial crisis hits, and they go steadily down. Why? They go up. Of course, they shoot up when he makes a vigorous response to September 11th. There's a huge rally around the flag thing. We're going after Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. Seems to make perfect sense, something, by the way, I supported. Um, but then as the rest of his foreign policy project goes badly, his approval ratings begin to tank and are really remarkable. So the American people do observe this, and I think their instincts on a lot of these questions are actually pretty good. Do you want to add anything? No. Sure. No, I think uh, I find it very difficult to interpret public polling on foreign policy questions because it's for, for precisely the reason that Professor Walt has pointed to. Without uh, a well-defined set of competing alternatives, uh, the American public can't really take cues on a lot of issues from uh, Source, sources from those kinds of sources that should be there to let the American public weigh what their values are, what their priorities are, and what's in their interest. So on questions like NATO, it's now the case that support, general support for NATO has gone up, actually, in the Trump era. But does one really think that uh, political support for NATO in the United States is more solid today than it was before the rise of Donald Trump? Probably not. It's probably bound up with the same kinds of partisan uh, politics that seem to be affecting so many other questions. So one of the things that uh, Professor Walt does in the book is point to questions that have been asked repeatedly by the same pollsters over a number of decades pertaining to US leadership in the world, questions like exceptionalism. There, I think we can get a little bit better sense, but in the absence of uh, a robust uh, uh, foreign policy community, it is very difficult to, to understand on particular issues what the, what the public thinks. And, and I'll also mention, and Steve, Steve cites it in the book, the work that my colleagues uh, Trevor Thrall and Eric Opner in particular have done on 
a millennial attitudes towards foreign policy. There are, there are key distinctions in terms of generations, from generation to generation on foreign policy, and they do appear to be shifting. The question always is, will those opinions among the millennial generation stay fixed as they grow older, or will they age out? Will those, and, and that's always sort of the perennial question when it comes to uh, age cohorts and polling on, on the basis of age cohorts. All right, let me get some folks on this side of the aisle. I'll, uh, I'll switch places. Uh, right there, yeah, in the middle reception, and then I'll get you over there, sir, in the side. Go ahead. Thanks. Uh, Andrew Yo, associate professor at Catholic University. My question is whether the problem is the consensus or the foreign policy blob that you mentioned, or if the problem is more with the idea of liberal hegemony itself. Because it seems like up until at least 1990, uh, there isn't that much criticism to liberal hegemony. And I ask that because I wonder, as we see uh, the gospel of restraint uh, spreading, and I, I think it's only going to continue to grow as we see different security studies centers being funded uh, in ways that support this restraint idea. Is it possible if a new consensus arises around restraint that that in itself also becomes problematic because people are not listening to outside voices? Thank you. Good, thank you. That's great. That's a great question. Um, yeah, I, I could imagine a, a consensus uh, emerging around the set of ideas over the next 25 or 30 years. And if it got locked in in much the same way, you could argue that could lead to trouble depending on what happened in the world and what that uh, required. The only point I want to emphasize, though, is that as I th think of the strategy of offshore balancing, it is a strategy that is, that is acutely sensitive to the condition of the world. Right? It, it, you, you suggest that your foreign policy, your military commitments, where you're engaged, should be determined in large part by what's going on in key centers of uh, world power, uh, in particular sort of advanced industrial areas, places that have critical resources, whatever. So an offshore balancer says, you know, look, we don't want any single country to control all the oil in the Middle East, because that could have damaging effects on the world economy if they began manipulating the supply or anything like that. So if a country looks like like it might be posing a threat to the balance of power in the Middle East, we should respond, as we did, say, in the first Gulf War, as we might have to at some point down the road if Iran really started to look like it was uh, about to dominate the region, or anybody else for that matter, right? Or an outside power, as we worried about with the Soviet Union, as we one day might worry about China, seem to dominate that region. So it's not a, a sort of fixed one size, this is our policy forever. It does respond to what's happening in particular parts of the world. My um, interest in balancing China would diminish if China's growth and assertiveness were to slow down because the need would be declining. So in a sense, an offshore balancer has to be very engaged and very attentive to what's going on in the world because you have to change your policy if circumstances change. Now, because the United States is so powerful and so wealthy and so protected over here, we don't have to have a, like a hair trigger response. We can you know, take, take our time in most cases to look at what's going on and see what's happening. But it is not an argument for a sort of rigid orthodoxy, here's what our our blueprint is, and we should never change it. And also, I believe we all make mistakes. Everything has problems built into it. So I wouldn't want to see a unified, monolithic foreign policy establishment that agreed with everything I believe, uh, however flattering that might be, because that would eventually get us into trouble, too. Can I, I want to pick up on that, Steve, too. This is something I flagged in the book, and I've, I've thought about this before. If you believe, and I, I think you do from reading your other work, that um, all other factors being equal, countries are more likely to balance than to bandwagon, right? The great debate over balancing or bandwagoning, right? And if that's true, if, I've, if, if I'm characterizing that correctly, and you believe that we live mostly in a balancing world and not a bandwagoning world, then how much offshore balancing is actually required, because what you're talking about is the need to compensate for underbalancing. You need the need to compensate for countries not behaving as a person who believes in a balancing world believes that they will. So can you, can you respond to that? I'll try. I mean, I don't think there's a, a nice formula you can apply. I think the United States uh, 
deeply engaged in Europe and went onshore in the Cold War because we concluded that the European countries could not muster the economic and military power by themselves to deal with the Soviet Union. We may have overstated what the danger was, but the Soviet Union was very big, very powerful, large army, proximate, etc. And Europe, particularly in the 1950s, was still recovering from World War II, and we didn't think they would get their act together enough, so we would have to stay there. And, you know, Eisenhower spent the 50s trying to figure out a way to get American troops out of Europe, and he could never quite figure out a way to do it uh, reliably, so we stayed. Um, we eventually uh, lowered our troop levels, of, and after the Cold War, we lowered them even more dramatically. Um, Similarly, how much effort does the United States have to engage in in Asia to make sure that enough Asian countries want to keep China from dominating? I, I don't have a precise formula there. There's going to be a certain amount of misrepresentation on both sides. So our allies are going to threaten to bandwagon to get us to do more. We're going to threaten to withdraw to get them to do more. Some of that is just sort of the usual diplomatic horse trading. Uh, and that can be dangerous in, sure. in itself. But I don't think there's a, a rigid formula. It sort of depends on a case-by-case -case basis what you think the estimate of the danger is and the capabilities of the local actors. Uh, okay, there along the wall. Now, and those of you in the back, I, I, my eyes are not great, but I, but I can in fact see you in the back. So if you raise your hand, I might even call on you. <clears throat> Hi, Professor Wall, Rob Levinson, Bloomberg Government. <clears throat> uh, you mentioned the lack of accountability for costs and mistakes. You talked about Paul Wolfowitz and the Iraq War and things like that. I do this experiment now and then in Washington. I ask people around the room, I say, how many soldiers have we lost in Iraq? Very few people can actually answer the question with any degree of accuracy. And the ones who can, I say, then name one. And the usual, I get blank stares. I wonder if this idea of this foreign policy elite, the disconnectedness of that elite from the people who, you know, we have, we're currently engaged in about seven countries in active combat operations. I wonder if the lack of engagement of that foreign policy elite with their sons and daughters being in those engagements and coming home to Dover Air Force Base or Walter Reed is, is part of this problem. Uh, I think there's no question about it. I actually talk about this in uh, one of the chapters about part of concealing the costs has been to sort of make sure that a lot of this international activity is happening on page 17 of the newspaper down low and not uh, visible. Uh, the all-volunteer force is a critical part of this, and there's a larger debate on whether an all-volunteer force is the right policy or not. That's a separate issue. Uh, but it does have the consequence that the people who do end up fighting these wars are people who volunteered to do so. Uh, as well. And, you know, I just think of what life at Harvard would be like if we were, had done these things for the past 25 years with a draft army, where Harvard undergraduates were being selected by, you know, a lottery system or, or anything like that. I think it would have changed it uh, almost entirely. It also has this funny paradox. I mean, I think every president from Clinton forward has understood that the American people did not want to lose a lot of lives, that none of these wars were really worth a high blood price, if you will. Um, so we've relied, uh, we've worked very hard to limit casualties, which is a good thing, and we rely very heavily on air power and drones and other things, special forces, a variety of ways to try and minimize American casualties. The problem is that also makes it really hard to win a lot of these wars. Too, if you're not willing to sort of put anything at risk, you can spend a lot of money, but not a lot of lives. So paradoxically, you can stay in them forever because there really isn't a lot of public outcry, but you can't win them either. And eventually the public gets tired. You know, 17 years after Afghanistan, you start to recognize that the American people would be perfectly happy if we left Afghanistan, All right? Um, so, you know, I think there's a real paradox in how we've chosen to do a lot of this. All right, on the left-hand side there. Um, Augusta Salzona, social conservative, ad advisor to the uh, Trump for President campaign 2016, Central Committee member, Maryland Republican Party. Um, I'm not a fan of John Bolton, so let me. So, <laughs> I, I, All right, please, your question. Thank you. Yeah, my uh, um, question is this is uh, 
Is there a place for social conservatives as I guess what I'm seeing here, maybe sort of the birth of a, maybe a realignment of the new world order, however defined in terms of something which is, provides an alternative what the foreign policy elite has been coming up with for the last quarter century? Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I don't get into, uh, if I understand what people mean when they say social conservatives, I, it's not something that I address in the book. The book is pretty much associated with, um, with foreign policy issues. I think the one place that there is a sort of obvious connection is the whole issue of immigration. Right, because that's a domestic policy issue, but it has very important foreign policy uh, implications as well. And I think, and this is, again, I want to emphasize, not a subject I spend a lot of time uh, reading or thinking about, but I do think we are seeing in a number of different places, most visibly in Europe, but also uh, here in the United States, um, the, a broad concern about immigration and the desire for the country to be able to control who comes in and who doesn't, right? That is sort of a defining feature of a nation is you sort of determine who uh, the membership is. I think the United States has benefited enormously from being open to the world and being very good at attracting uh, talented people from all over the world. I have a slide in one of my talks where I sort of show the top 10 companies created by first and second generation immigrants to the United States. And it's, you know, Apple and IBM and Qualcomm and a whole series of others that you would all, all recognize. So I think this is a, a, still an exceptional benefit. And if we slam the door on that, we are ultimately hurting ourselves. That said, that doesn't mean it has it was going to be an unregulated matter, and that's I think the same thing we're just, that Europeans are discovering. And the problem for Europe is, by the way, going to be much more significant than for us, given geography and given the demography of some of the regions close to Europe. The Mediterranean is not nearly as big as the Atlantic Ocean. That uh, tempts people to try and get there, and it ultimately uh, with considerably uh, tragic results, but it also creates big political problems that I think are going to be bedeviling Europe for a long time. Uh, let's see. Uh, question back there. And then I see one way, way in the back. I can see you, so we'll call on you next. In fact, why don't you make your way all the way back as far as you can go. Go ahead, sir. Uh, I'm Ed Dean Ahmed with the Minaret of Freedom Institute. Follow up to that last question. One area where social conservatives do care deeply about foreign policy, uh, evangelicals whose uh, millennialist, view, millennialist views uh, often uh, support interventionism. Could you, do you address that in the book or would you address that now? Uh, yeah, I don't uh, explicitly call them out in, um, in the book, but they would be, it seems to me, uh, people who who believe American foreign policy should be informed by a particular set of religious beliefs are part of this sort of large log rolling coalition. And uh, they would fit in nicely, it seems to me, with the title of the book, The Hell of Good Intentions, because I think their intentions in most cases are, are uh, noble in the sense that they think they're gonna be bringing something wonderful Christianity, some other religion to uh, another uh, society. Uh, and I don't think uh, any religious document is a particularly good guide to foreign policy. Fill in the blank of whichever religious text you happen to like. Steve? Yeah, just to add to that, I mean, it must be significant in terms of the fate of what you call liberal hegemony that the Trump administration has taken this constituency in a quite different direction that rejects the liberal notion that fundamentally relationships in the world work to mutual advantage. The whole pitch that uh, Donald Trump made in the last election was about how uh, the rest of the world was exploiting the United States and it was time to turn the tables. And so this must be a very significant uh, uh, fracturing of the political coalition that underpin liberal hegemony. Yeah, that's a really good point. I also, I'm glad you brought up the whole log rolling thing. I teach, I teach a class in foreign policy and we use the national security strategy, which is sort of 
the epitome of a laundry list, right? A, a document that's created in a, con a country that can do lots of things simultaneously does lots of things simultaneously. And you find very few occasions for why someone would say, no, it's, you can take my particular area of the world off the list. I don't really, you know, if I'm left out, I, it doesn't matter. That doesn't happen. Uh, in the back, yes, sir, right there. Hello, I'm Amin Mohsini from American University. Thank you for the insightful speech. Uh, you, you speak up just a yes, little bit, sir. Sure. Okay. You mentioned Iran uh, half a dozen times in your, in your talk, and I just came back from Iran for two years of teaching and researching in Tehran University. So this issue of normalizing the relationship with Iran is particularly interesting to me. How do you suggest that would play out given the hawkish and powerful lobby and interest groups in this town in the long run? Thank you. Uh, well, yeah, it would obviously be politically controversial uh, <laughs> for all sorts, of, all sorts of reasons. But let me explain why I think that's the case. I mean, uh, first of all, I, I think the, Amer the core American interest in the Middle East is to ensure that no one dominates the entire region, as I indicated, uh, largely for reasons related to energy. Just as a footnote there, that motivation may gradually decline over time if the United States and others start weaning ourselves off of fossil fuels. Um, and so the importance of Middle East oil in the world economy begins to decline over time, uh, et cetera. You could imagine uh, that world, and we would therefore care less about it for strategic reasons. We might have other reasons as well. Um, so first of all, my reading is that none of our current Middle East clients uh, Egypt, Israel, Saudi Arabia, the other Gulf states are deserving of unconditional American support. Notice I'm not saying we shouldn't support them. It shouldn't be unconditional. These, these shouldn't be special relationships. All of them have, from an American perspective, pretty substantial warts at this point. All right. Similarly, we have various issues with Iran that are serious disagreements and serious differences, but none of them strike me as disqualifying for doing business with them. We've done business with regimes we really didn't like, and I believe our president is now having a love affair with the dictator who runs North Korea. From an American perspective, we want to be talking to everyone in that part of the world, right? Not because we're necessarily going to agree with them, but when an American Secretary of State shows up in Riyadh, I want people in Saudi Arabia to know that his next stop is Tehran. <laughs> and when he's in Tehran, I want them to know that his stop after that is Tel Aviv, right? And after that, he's going to Cairo, and after that, he's going to Ankara, right? Because if that's the world we're living in, each of those regimes starts to have an incentive to try and say, what can I do to appeal to the United States? What can I do to get on their good side? As opposed to taking American support for granted, because we're only talking to one side here. Right. So in terms of maximizing American diplomatic leverage, having business-like relations with everybody in the Middle East makes a lot more sense to being firmly on one side and not even talking to the other. Okay, we have time for about two more questions. So let me get uh, in the back there, sir. And then there, in the white sweater. Keep your hand up, Sar. Yeah. Hi. Go, go ahead. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Yuri Nevis. I'm a student at Georgetown in the SSP program. Um, my question is in regards to human rights. Under the ideas that you suggested, how can the U.S. best support human rights if not, um, as you mentioned, the ways that we've been trying to expand human rights and uh, improve upon it have failed? Um, so the United States should continue to stand up for human rights and we should be willing to have really candid conversations with uh, countries, including allies, when we think they're, uh, they're violating them. Uh, we should also uh, be ready in some circumstances to use uh, our capabilities, including our military capabilities, to stop really heinous, you know, mass killings, possible genocides, things like that. Um, but I would set the bar very high for doing it. Right. And in particular, uh, I would say that you sh we shouldn't do that unless we think we can do it at an acceptable cost to the United States. That's important. And we're reasonably confident that our intervention is not going to make things worse. Right. Um, and this has to be judged, it seems to me, on a case by case basis. So the debate on Syria was really a debate over whether or not getting more deeply involved, and we were involved from the very beginning, but getting more deeply involved was going to make things better or make things worse. 
rightly or wrongly, President Obama made the judgment that deeper American involvement there was going to actually make things worse, that toppling the Assad regime was actually going to leave uh, anarchy, uh, if you will, and likely produce uh, opportunities for the, most, the worst forms of extremist groups, et cetera. Maybe that was wrong, but that was the judgment he made. And that's, I think, the way one has to think about this as well. One final point is there is a difference between supporting a set of ideals and recognizing that there are trade-offs, that sometimes you're gonna compromise those ideals for other purposes, and pretending those ideals don't really matter at all. And one of my criticisms of the Trump administration, and it is a place where they've departed a little bit from the past, is they seem to be remarkably indifferent to most of those concerns, except as a club to beat adversaries over the head with, um, but nothing in their rhetoric, nothing in their conduct suggests these are really important. Uh, so that, that's different than acknowledging that we care about these ideals, but we also have some other goals we have to try and balance against them. On the, uh, along those lines, do, did you also think there was a mistake to intervene in Libya? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Beforehand, as well as after. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Partly because we promised we wouldn't. I'm Sahar Khan. I'm also from the Cato Institute. So um, there's this th dominant literature, especially within South Asia, which is that when the Soviets withdrew from Afghanistan, the U.S. also left. And because of that, that's one of the reasons why Afghanistan has sort of become what it is, and that's one of the reasons why the Taliban developed. Um, it's not something I personally necessarily agree with, but I always find myself struggling to explain um, in a somewhat logical way why it made sense for the U.S. to leave. So I would be interested to hear your views, because that would be one case where you could argue that restraint perhaps didn't work or did work or made sense at the time. So I'd love to hear your views on that. Yeah. Um, you know, it's possible that if the United States had stayed somewhat more actively involved in Afghanistan, uh, that this would have averted the, what happened in the 90s, uh, the eventual triumph of the Taliban. Um, it's possible. Uh, it's also just as likely we could have stayed involved and we would have become the focus of some of the Taliban mobilizing. What are these, uh, you know, the latest set of people who aren't from around here coming in and telling us, uh, telling us what to do. Um, I just, I think the record of the past 25 years or so uh, should be a reminder of, first of all, there's lots of unintended consequences out there. And we ought to be really humble about our ability to do social engineering in places we really don't understand very well. Turns out other countries don't like being told what to do any more than we do, right? And if we just sort of look around, you know, we're not doing such a great job of running the United States right now. You look at the state and local governments in some of the states, you know, I always like to say, we don't know how to run the state of Illinois uh, anymore. And when we figure out how to run the state of Illinois, then we can figure out how to run some faraway province whose languages we don't speak that have lots of different ethnic groups contending with each other. So it's not that the United States, you just pull back and say, forget it. Uh, I'd be f in favor of the United States helping promote economic development, helping uh, deal with public health issues. Uh, there's a lot of positive things, and I talk about them in the book, that American foreign policy has, in fact, done. But trying to remodel the politics of different societies is probably going to fail far more often. Uh, then it succeeds, and especially in countries that are very different uh, than we are. Very good. Unintended consequences. I've read that somewhere. Okay. Um, thank. Please join me in thanking uh, Steve and Stephen. Um, contrary to what you might believe, we here at the Cato Institute do believe in a free lunch, or at least it's free to you. Uh, so please join us on the second floor in the George M. Yeager Conference Center. Hi everyone, my name's Mike, I'm the creator of Mox News, and for the last 15 years I have been telling you that as long as I have the support of the community that I serve, Mox News will post videos forever, and that's the truth. As long as I have your support, no one can ever make me stop. Unfortunately, currently, Mox News uh, viewers, <coughs> damn it.
Hi everyone, my name is Mike. I'm the creator of Mox News. And uh, for the last 15 years, I have been telling you that uh, as long as I have the support of the community that I serve, Mox News will post videos forever. And that's the truth. As long as I have your support, no one could ever make me stop. Unfortunately, currently, less than one half of one tenth of one percent of Mox News viewers ever donate, tip, or contribute anything back. Again, let me make that really clear. Much less than one half of one tenth of one percent ever give anything back. And to those of you who have donated to Mox News, I want to thank you so much because it's because of your generosity that we have been able to bring attention to important videos that millions and millions of eyes would have never seen. And I think that that's a, a, an amazing thing that we've been able to make happen together. And I can't thank you enough for helping me make that happen. So it's not too late. If you'd like to see Mox News covering the 2020 presidential election, if you can't imagine the 2020 presidential election without Mox News, please, there's still time. You can make a difference. It's easy to make a contribution, donation, or tip. Uh, you can go to MoxNews.com or in the text body of this video, there are clickable links to the Patron page or to um, the PayPal page and and again it should take less than two minutes to make a donation and your donation can make a big difference so I thank you all stay cool one of these days this war is gonna end and it would be awesome if Mox News could be there to celebrate that day with you